Hello mortals. Back in 1945, American scientists built what now is known as the first programmable computer, which was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, or the ENIAC. Its purpose was to calculate the exact trajectory the military should throw their bombs at for maximum destruction. Normally these calculations were done by hand, which could take up to 12 whole hours to complete, but the military needs maximum destruction right away. So they poured all the taxpayer money into science and churned out this incredibly super-fast processor with a clock speed of 100 kilohertz, 30,000 times slower than your phone processor. But it was enough for what they needed, as it was completing those complex ballistic calculations in only 30 seconds. And all it needed was 18,000 vacuum tubes, 70,000 resistors, and 10,000 capacitors put together into a box the size of a tennis court. Today, all such calculations would be performed on the scale of nanometers, so let's discuss how we got this far. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Transistors are the unsung heroes of the digital age, quietly working behind the scenes to make our technology-driven world possible. But what exactly is a transistor? It can be described as a tiny device that acts like a traffic policeman for electrons, controlling and amplifying the flow of electricity with incredible precision and speed. But before them, there was another, a much bulkier and slower magic piece of metal, the vacuum tube. What these vacuum tubes do is essentially the same as transistors, but the way they do it is different. You have these two things called the cathode and the anode. The cathode produces electrons and the anode collects them when a potential difference is applied to it. Before transistors were adapted in the 50s, vacuum tubes were essential in every piece of electronics, from TVs and radios to telephone lines and horses, or whatever people in the 50s used for transportation. And for these vacuum tubes, the beginning of the end started in 1926 when physicist Julius Lilienfeld proposed the concept of a field effect transistor. He was the first to record an idea about semiconductor switches that could replace vacuum tubes, using electrostatic fields to manipulate electrons instead of heat. But he never really made an actual working transistor. That was done in the Bell Labs over two decades later, in 1947. It was a relatively small device made of germanium with three electrodes, called the emitter, base, and collector. It was capable of amplifying electronic signals and controlling the flow of electric current. The Bell Labs researchers were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for that in 1956. The transistor quickly replaced vacuum tubes in pretty much all electronic devices. It also paved the way for the development of something called the integrated circuit, which allowed for many transistors to be combined on a single chip, further reducing the size and cost of electronic devices. It is hard to grasp the entire technical side of transistors in one YouTube video, but I'll try to summarize, so buckle up for a nerdy ride. As I just mentioned, a transistor is, simply put, a sandwich of semiconductors, usually made up from the receiver, the collector, and the base in the middle. These two elements have lots of free electrons in them, unlike the base. This creates this boundary between the two layers known as a PN junction. When the current inside the base is zero, it creates a depletion region, a region where there are no free electrons, making the entire transistor non-conducting, as no current could pass through this region. But once you apply current to the base, it generates an electric field allowing electrons to flow and conduct electricity. It's essentially a switch on the nanoscale, alternating between conducting and non-conducting states and vice versa, and these states are how we represent ones and zeros in binary code. Modern transistors being used now are somewhat different from those that were invented in the late 1940s. So yes, instead of the junction-type transistors, your phone has millions of what we call field-effect transistors, most of which are metal oxide semiconductor field-effect transistors, or MOSFETs. If transistors had taken over the world, MOSFETs took over everything. Picture the semiconductor sandwich, but now it's U-shaped. There's a section in the middle made of a P-type semiconductor that is the base, and two arms made of N-type semiconductors. There are electrodes attached to each arm, they are known as the source and the drain, and there is the electrode attached to the base, that's called a gate. When a voltage is applied to the gate electrode, depending on its polarity, we can create electric fields that either attract or repel electrons in the channel. This changes the conductivity of the channel, which in turn controls the flow of current between the source and drain electrodes. By varying the voltage applied to the gate, 
the MOSFET can be used as switches or amplifiers. That's more or less how the billions of transistors inside the device on which you are watching this video right now work. And if you're a bit of a PC building geek, you might know that the newest processors are built on a nanometer scale, such as the 5 nanometers process, whereas just in the year 2000, a much bigger 180 nanometers process was used. Something something Moore's Law. But you see, this nanometer process size is just a marketing clickbait term made by microchip manufacturers, as the term 5 nanometers has no relation to any actual physical features. A 5 nanometers node is expected to have a contacted gate pitch of 51 nanometers. Yet even those sizes are ridiculously small. And the smaller we go, the more prominent the interference of quantum mechanics will be. As we shrink transistors down, the closer the source and the drain are to each other, the higher the chance of electrons quantum tunneling across, essentially real-life subatomic teleportation. So in the future, instead of lag, you might blame quantum tunneling for making you lose, but that's the price we must pay for moving humanity forward. Another thing that will help humanity move forward is scientific literacy. To achieve that, look no further than Brilliant.org. Their visual, hands-on approach is an effective and engaging way to master the key concepts behind today's technology, keeping your math and computer science skills sharp and expanding your understanding of advanced topics like AI, neural networks, and more. Continual learning is essential for career success, and Brilliant makes it easy to build a daily learning habit. Take the Computer Science Fundamentals course, and see for yourself what happens when you apply logic to billions of transistors, from algorithms to decision-making. But Brilliant isn't just for technical know-how. It boosts your creative problem-solving skills, helping you navigate the world of tomorrow. And it's also built for busy people, with bite-sized lessons that break down important concepts into understandable parts. You can gradually master whole topics in as little as 15 minutes a day, and learn anywhere, anytime on your phone, tablet, or computer. Interactive learning has been proven to be six times more effective than passive learning, like watching lecture videos. With Brilliant, you learn by doing. So hurry up and visit brilliant.org slash science file or click on the link in the description to get a 30-day free trial, while the first 200 of you will also get 20% off their annual subscription.